thanks for tuning in today to Front Porch Conversations here at Advent Christian Village. We are at the Harmony Center this morning, and I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Nan O'Byrne. Good Nan, morning. welcome. Thank you. Uh, Nan, you moved to the village how long ago? I moved to the village in November of 2022, but I actually didn't start living here uh, on a full-time basis until uh, May of this past year. Uh, I had a little problem getting my house sold, and so it, uh, my furniture was here, but I was back in my hometown trying to get everything sold and get moved over here. Well, I'm glad that's all behind you. I bet yep. you are too. Yes, I am. <laughs> From what you told me, you shared with me, it was quite a, a project. Yes, it was, mm -hmm. very much so. And what is your hometown? Well, it was Beverly Hills, Florida, but that's not where I'm originally from. Right. And where are you originally from? From I was born in Waldo, Florida, and was raised in Gainesville, Florida. So that's my actual hometown was Waldo. Well, I have to tell our viewers that Nancy and I had quite an um, encounter the other day about mm -hmm. that. She was telling me that you had grown up in Lodgeville County, so I asked more specifically. And then you wanted to know who my mother, because um, my mother grew up there. And so would you tell us that little story? Yes, uh, back when I was in Waldo, and this is a, a 75 year old memory. Um, I was about five years old and we lived down a dirt road and on that dirt road was a little house and a lady by the name of Mrs. Rollerson lived there. And every day going to school and coming home from school, I would stop and talk with her. And she was always so kind to me and so pleasant. And one day I was by and she needed a piece of fruit that was in one of the trees. And she said if she tried to climb that tree, that her daughter would spank her. So I went back to the tree with her and went up and got this piece of fruit. I don't remember whether it was a pear or an apple or what, but I got that piece of fruit for her. And within a year or two, we moved away. And I never knew what happened to her or anything. But a few years ago, I went back by and looked at the house that she lived in. And it just brought back a flood of memories of her because she touched my life at a very early age and she was always in my heart all of these years. And this is why we have porch conversations to learn things about each other. That was my grandmother. And she, um, she lived to be 99. Oh my, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this, this is exciting to me to find out something about someone who touched my life at such an early age. That's to me is very special. Well, and I think we have a special bond now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd like us to think about what happened the rest of your life and share some of that with us, with our viewers today. Okay. Um, when my mother left Waldo, we moved to Michigan for a little while. She didn't like the snow, and so we came back. And we came back and moved to Gainesville and lived with her mother, who is, uh, was Mary DeBose. And um, I went to school at Kirby Smith School and ultimately went to Gainesville High School, where I graduated at. But I graduated at in um, what they call back at that point in time, Contributive Business Education, CBE. And I was trained to be an office worker, bookkeeper, um, and that became the biggest occupation that I had in my life was being a bookkeeper. And you had siblings? You had, you had brothers or sisters? Yes, I have a total of 10 brothers and sisters. Oh. <laughs> well, tell um, us about them quickly. <laughs> yeah. My oldest brother and sister actually were my father's children from his first marriage, and his wife had died, and his children, his daughter was only 18 months old when her mother died, and he met my mother, and they married, and 
they in turn had nine children, of which I'm the baby. And um, all of my brothers and sisters have passed. But during the time that I was talking about in Waldo, um, my oldest brothers were all had all left and gone into the military for World War II. Mm -hmm. So they fought during World War II. And I, you know, have images in my mind of them coming home on leave and um, visiting with us at home and then leaving and going back. And my oldest brother was in the Navy and I always admired him. He was, he was my special brother. But when he would go back, now I'm talking when I'm six, seven, mm -hmm. eight years old, he would always leave and not have one of his Navy jumpers with him. And I would wear it to school thinking I was the prettiest thing that walked in school <laughs> because I had his Navy jumper on. And um, it was always a special time with my brothers and sisters. And But as I say, they have all passed now. And I'm the last remaining one of my family. When you were talking about your mother's, your grandmother's name, I know genealogy is important to you. Yes, it is. Could you share us a little bit about that? Um, my mother's family, the DuBoses, mm -hmm. came in through Charleston, South Carolina, and they were French Huguenots. And they had left France under the threat of death and went to England and swore allegiance to the king there and came into, at that time, it was Charlestown, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of history there. The original grandparents that came into Charleston were uh, Isaac and Suzanne Collindu. Uh, Collindu was my grandmother's name. And they had children, and the oldest son was named Isaac DeBose. And Isaac DeBose fought with Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, mm -hmm. during the Revolutionary War. And he was, um, there's quite a history there. And each time we go back, someone has found a new article. Um, they found a land deed that belonged to the original grandmother, Suzanne Collindu. And it actually still has her signature and wax seal on there. And they have restored that document. Some of the family members got together and paid to have that document restored back so that it could be shared with the family. And so there's quite a bit of information there about the family. And my father's family also came from Ireland and came into Charleston, South Carolina. but he and my mother did not meet until he had come to Gainesville and she had come to Gainesville. But the family, the DuBose family, came here out of Charleston, South Carolina, just prior to the Civil War, to try to stay out of the Civil War. And they came into the area of Santa Fe. And that's where a lot of the DuBose family is still out, is around that area of Alachua and Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you were trying to look for some of your DuBose relatives, so maybe somebody will be watching today. Yes. And we'll have a, a link, another <laughs> right. link there. And one of the, your favorite things you do, you said, is to go to your, the annual family reunion. Right. The annual reunion is in October of this year in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's always a lot of fun to get with them and talk about, you know, what we found this past year and, and go out to eat and... Uh, my favorite meal to go out and eat is shrimp and grits. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty close to my favorite. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so I always have to have shrimp and grits and the family knows it. So it's like, you know, where should we go tonight right. so we can get shrimp and grits. <laughs> when um, you graduated from Gainesville High School, what did you do next? Well, I left. I decided I wanted to go to a big town. So I went to Jacksonville. And I build insurance in a place called New Amsterdam Insurance Company that was in the Five Points area of Jacksonville. And I worked there for about three years. And my uh, boyfriend at that time, uh, his name was Eddie, his father was killed in an accident. And so he 
had moved to Jacksonville, well, he moved back to Gainesville, and I thought, I don't want to stay up here, so I moved back to Gainesville. Well, then he decided he'd move back to Jacksonville, and I thought, well, I'll move back to Jacksonville. <laughs> so he came to me, and his big proposal was, instead of us each moving back and forth between Gainesville and Jacksonville, why don't we just get married and we'll move together? So <laughs> we did, and we were married for 25 years before uh, he was killed in an accident in 1984. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, well, that's quite a proposal, though. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and you continued to work after you were married? Yes. Uh, well, I didn't for quite a few years, and then a friend of mine that went to church with us turned around to me one day during church, and she said, why don't you come to work for me? And she was head of the insurance billing department out at Shands. So I went to work for her at Shands, and I uh, was on a temporary basis, but I ultimately passed all of their exams and did everything they asked me to do and became a full-time employee at Shands. And I, it, it was like friends would, would lead me from one job to another. And I left there and went to work for um, a group called the Bureau of Crippled Children, and I think it's now called Children's Family Services. But we helped with any child that had any kind of medical problems uh, at all. And that was a very interesting job. And the kids that came in there, ultimately I met one of them as, as an adult and was able to talk to her and ask her about what she remembered about coming into Shands. And of course, as a child, she didn't remember a whole mm -hmm. lot about coming in there. But that was an interesting job. Was that the job you were sharing with me about, that you were involved in helping get burn children? Yes. Um, my husband at the time was a, was a Shriner. And they, of course, have the burn hospitals and the orthopedic hospitals. They have three burn hospitals and 19 orthopedic hospitals. And we had uh, two children come in and one was a little boy and I don't remember how he was burned but he was burned severely and the nurses realized that my husband was a Shriner and asked me if I had contacts to be able to get him into a burn hospital and I told them I did and so we contacted the proper people that would handle all the paperwork and all the information and everything and they borrowed the governor of the state of Florida's plane that year and flew into Gainesville. And they flew the medical staff and that burned child to Texas uh, to be taken care of. And the other child that I remember helping was a little girl who was the child of a migrant worker. And she was they had a fire outside and she was twirling around and she had a sweater on and she twirled around and that sweater caught in the fire and it set her on fire. Mm -hmm. So they needed to get her out there. So again, they transported her to Texas. They took the mother with them out there and then they in turn helped the father and the rest of the children return to Texas, help them find a home and actually help the father find a job so they would no longer have to move around the United mm -hmm. States. So the Shrine Hospitals are far more than just medical care. They, they take care of the family and care for the family. And that's, I know that was a special memory for you, being able to be involved in that. Yes, it was. And, and to, to know that somebody was out there that would reach out and, and take somebody like this. And, and I, the thought just hit me that it's like your grandmother reached out to a little kid and basically embraced me in her caring and love. And that's what the Shriners do. They embrace these children in, in caring and love and help them through a very, very difficult time. Well, I know I have a friend whose son was cared for at the Crippled Children's Hospital in Tampa 
for years, and um, they just receive wonderful care for yes. Him. Uh, another story that I can share with you is that a very, very, very good friend of of ours, who's the father was a Shriner, but his son was camping with some other people. And he decided, he was nine years old, and he decided the fire wasn't big enough. So he picked up a small can of gas and threw it on the fire. And when he did, the fire hit the flame, the fumes of that gas and come right back and just set him on fire because he had the fumes and everything all over his body. And he started running, which is the worst thing mm -hmm. you can do. And so his brother chased him down and knocked him down and rolled him on the ground. But Vincent was burned severely. And they also took Vincent out there. So I learned a lot about the hospitals firsthand through his mother. And of course, it burned one side of his face severely. I mean, it, if you're not prepared to see him, you'll, mm -hmm. you know, but he's, he was also taught how to respond to people that reacted that way when they saw him. And Vincent always handled himself well around other people. One time they went to see a very gory movie, and my son was with them, and they sat down on the second or third row and my son come home and he was laughing and he said, you won't believe this. And I said, what? He said, Mama, we stood up and Vincent turned around and at that time they had a white mask on him to help with the healing mm -hmm. of the scars. And he said, he turned around and was facing back after the lights came on, and he said it was like the parting of the ocean. <laughs> he said, people just parted, and we just walked right on out of the, the theater. And he said, because he just scared people in that theater to death, especially after watching that movie. Uh -huh. But Vincent received great care. Uh, he's a grown man now. He works. He has children. And... Uh, he went out one time and he came back and he looked so different. And I asked his mother, I said, what did they do differently? And she said, they rebuilt the bridge of his nose. That's all they had done. But his burns were so severe, he lost fingers on the hand that he was throwing the gas with. So my thing has always been, do not play in fire. Yeah. It is the most dangerous thing around. And it can happen in such an instant without yes. even you know, yes. being prepared. Well, we, you talked about your son, but tell us about your children. Um, I have three children. Um, my youngest is a nurse, and she uh, lives in Indiana. And right now she is teaching um, at a college, teaching medical courses mm -hmm. at a college. And... Um, she is also going to school to get her master's degree in nursing. And because she became a diabetic when she was 20 years old, and that's 40 years ago, she told me the other night, do you feel old now? I said, <laughs> <laughs> but um, she has become very interested in diabetes and, and she said, I can help because I know what the patient feels like. So therefore, uh, that's going to be her, her major work for the rest of her life is in diabetes through nursing care. And um, my middle daughter, her name is Sybil, and she was named after my sister, Sybil. And she lives out in Panama City, and she had cancer some years ago, so she is disabled at this point in time. And then I had a son, his name was also Eddie. We had four Eddies in the family. <laughs> and his name was Eddie. And um, tragically, um, May a year ago, uh, Eddie contacted a, a disease that took his life within five months after he contacted it. Oh my gosh. And um, that was 
a life-changing event for me that ultimately caused me to um, come here to the village because I thought if I, he was my end-of-life care person. Mm -hmm. And I felt that without that, that I would need to look at some way to get some help should I need it towards the end of my life. And how did you go about looking for a community? I have a friend, Liz Reynolds. A lot of people mm -hmm. here probably know her. Right. She and I RV'd together. And when all of this happened, she had talked to me quite some years ago about moving up here. And I said, oh, no, 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 you know, mm -hmm. I'm fine. I've got everything said, everything's good. So after this happened, I called her and we had a long talk and we decided that I would come up here. And so he died in May and in June, I came up here and stayed for about two weeks. And I thought, this is my answer. And I can't tell you how the village made me feel at that time. It's um, the thought went through my mind that I'm standing on godly soil. And that's honestly how I felt. And I thought, you know, there's people here that are working towards our ultimate end of being with God. And I felt it, and I felt it strongly. And I thought, this will work. So we set about finding a, a place, and, and a, a location came available, and I bought the, it's in Park of the Pines, and I bought it and proceeded to pack my stuff to move up here. And you're actually really now living here. Yes. <laughs> Not back and forth. <laughs> no, my house is sold and I am here. <laughs> Great. Of course, I'm, I'm renovating a lot over there and, and uh, getting people to show up to do the work is, is another story by itself. Well, why don't you share with us about some of your RVing experiences? Um, I started RVing in about 2004. So I've been RVing right at 20 years. And um, through knowing Liz, and we have a group of women that are from all over the United States, and we all stay in contact with each other by computer. And there were six of us that decided we needed to go drive to Alaska. So in 2012, six of us started out to Alaska and ultimately there was only four of us uh, left in Alaska. So we broke off in twos and toured Alaska and that was one of the most beautiful trips that I think I've ever taken. And uh, it truly is the last frontier. Mm -hmm. And we stayed two weeks on a lake and kayaked every day, came back, walked the dogs, ate our lunches, go back out in the kayaks. It was it was a wonderful trip. Learned a lot about Alaska and the people there and things that had happened. And my brother had been there during, uh, right after an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And he told me about that. And sure enough, um, being there, I learned a lot about that earthquake and about what had happened to people there, which uh, it was very tragic, very tragic. What year was the earthquake? Um, I want to say 1962, okay. 1963, somewhere along in that time frame. And um, our next trip, we, um, Liz Reynolds and I went to Nova Scotia. And that was quite a trip. We went on the island to see the House of Green Gables, mm -hmm. which yeah, that's a book series, right. and that was that was a wonderful trip, and um, got to see so much and and do so much up there. And of course, then I we came back and in 2018, I think it was, um, I drove to California. Um, one of my grandsons lived in California at that time, and I drove to California and toured California, had, had no idea that California had so many volcanic activities out there, but that was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And you're still RVing? 
Yes, I still RV some, and um, not as much as I did. Mine now are, I'll take the RV to Charleston, South Carolina when I go there, and I can take my dog, and, and he's comfortable and I'm comfortable, so that's how we'll go. And tell us about your dog. Oh, Ashleen, um, she's about the tenth dog I guess I've had, and she is a rescue dog. Uh, she came out of Sisters County Rescue, and she's a little chihuahua. And I was looking for a small dog. I was actually looking for a miniature pincher, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the type of dog I always had. And she was the only small dog, and she was back in the corner, shaking, scared to death. And I said, well, what about her? And ultimately, I took her home with me, and that was three years ago, and she's still with me. The little miniature pinchers are, they're about this high and look very much like the Dobermans, mm -hmm. um, but they're very smart. They were bred as uh, rat catchers, and they're very good at that. And one of the stories on my mailman pen, one of the last mailman pens that I had, uh, at that time we had a pool at the house where I lived, and I saw something in the pool and I walked out and looked and it was a squirrel. And Bear, the men pin, walked over and stuck his nose over the edge of the pool and the squirrel reached up and very gently bit him on the nose, grabbed him on each side of the cheeks like this and when Bear pulled back, the squirrel, wet squirrel came out of the pool and he ran then and got underneath the grill cover and ran round and round and around in the grill cover and the dog is chasing him and I'm laughing and I thought, where is the camera? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, guess what? The camera is going to end right now too. So okay. thank you for coming and sharing today. All right, it's thank great you. getting to know you. And thank you so much for tuning in to Front Porch Conversations.